Half a day, welcome to Weekend Edition. I'm Tyler Matanani. Just a couple of months ago, the prison was flooded with COVID-19 infections. Now feeling better prepared, the Department of Corrections is renovating the dome area that will serve as an additional isolation facility on the compound. According to DOC spokesperson Anton Uggen, in addition to the demolition occurring, the department is working to promote 29 individuals as officers. Our, uh, our, our, our uh, leadership, we lost a lot of, lot of senior staff over the last few years that were never replaced. When COVID entered the prison, there were staff shortfalls due to COVID-19 infections. Again, adds that 60 employees have volunteered to take the vaccine, of which only 24 have already been vaccinated. He explains. You have to wait for the 90-day window. There's a, a requirement that if you've had COVID, you can't take the test for at least 90, uh, the vaccine for at least 90 days after. So we have a few that are, you know, that want to take it, but they have to wait until after February, sometime in February to take it. So. As for inmates, Major Again says there are quite a few who want to take the vaccine and are eligible. Although there is no word from public health on when prisoners will be offered the vaccine, KUM reached out to DPHSS PIO Janela Carrera, who said, quote, at this time, we are still look, working on a plan to get DOC correction officers inoculated, unquote. In Superior Court, three more grand jury indictments charge individuals with drug possession for separate cases. Brian James Duenas Machi was indicted for possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third degree felony, two counts of criminal mischief as a misdemeanor, and two counts of criminal trespass as a petty misdemeanor. According to court documents on December 31st, he allegedly committed the, the offenses at both Pacific Start and Garden Villa hotels in Tumon. Also facing drug charges, Ryan J. Cruz was indicted for possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third degree felony. He was arrested on January 4th, 2021. The following day, officers arrested Eddie William Solace. He faces possession of a Schedule II controlled substance with intent to deliver as a, as a first degree felony and possession of a Schedule II controlled substance as a third degree felony. A grand jury indictment also came down on Carlos Anthony Santos Mendiola for theft by receiving a motor vehicle as a second degree felony. He was arrested on August 5th, 2020 for allegedly stealing a 2018 Hyundai Elantra. A shortage of temporary worker housing may be slowly slowing down a local construction surge. The legislature's land committee held an oversight hearing today to get an update on an apparent backlog in the approval of barracks construction. Representatives from various agencies and commissions involved in the review and approval process were brought in. Guam Land Use Commission Director Joe Borja said previously some 22,000 units were approved, but less than 3,000 were actually built. Plans may have been shelved because of the high visa rejection rate for H-2 workers for private sector projects. For these uh, uh, workers, to come in. So number of units approved to be built, 22,000 actually built, about 3,000. But these applications that are pending before the commission or that are being submitted or these uh, commissions are from specific contractors that probably already have their projects online and they need these workers. And in order to get these workers in, uh, they need the housing, you know, the certified housing. Outside the fence, construction projects are expected to pick up steam with a new provision in the recently passed defense budget bill that grants approval for foreign labor for all Guam projects. The Homeland Security Department also reinstated the Philippines to the H-2 worker program. The majority of skilled foreign laborers in Guam are brought in from the Philippines. Three cheers to the company of the year. 11 talented young people from five local high schools came together, conceived a project, built an organization, and worked as a team to bring their idea to life, and were justly rewarded for their hard work. Creatability was one of eight student companies participating in junior achievement this year, learning valuable lessons about the capitalism process through practical exercises with real deadlines. And the fruits of their labor is Inventibu, a book showcasing our island's unique and rich culture, which they designed and set up a distribution pipeline for on Instagram and local bookstores. I'm happy that it was a team victory because it's 
it, it was just an amazing feeling because I can't, I obviously can't take all the credit for our success because it was everyone's, everyone took part in that. M me, production, marketing, finance, my co-president, John, everyone contributed to our success and I was just happy for everyone in the company. Company co-president Padme Madrigal said that while she and her co-president led from the front and pushed hard, they learned the judging criteria wasn't about sheer hard numbers or sales volume, but the greater accomplishment of coming together as a group and working towards a common goal. They made comments on how cohesive we seemed as a team because they said between the offices we had really great chemistry between each other and they said that we actually looked like we liked each other. <laughs> we here at KUAM proudly sponsored CreateAbility with our Krista Gaza and Marie Calvo Mons serving as mentors. Gaza said the one redeeming quality that the founders exhibited early on was a drive to succeed, mutual respect for each other, and a rare genuine teamwork dynamic that allowed them not just to complete their goal, but to thrive in the most odd of working conditions. We tried really hard to, um, to just instill the importance of their learning. That was more, it really for this program, for this program to be successful in any uh, situation, especially during something like COVID and, and these restrictions, you really have to embrace learning, learning about each other, learning what we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing, um, keeping up with deadlines, understanding how important deadlines are for the rest of the company down the line. Um, so it was really neat to see how every week they kind of grew and took on more responsibility. Madrigal was likewise honored with the President of the Year Award, which, true to form as a leader, she credits to her team of co-founders. From the very beginning, we had an honest conversation with each other about how we would work together and like take turns leading meetings. And we had different strengths and different weaknesses. So we really used that to our advantage and we became a team who led the company well, I would say. Gaza also praised the group's natural knack for business, which really came through when delegating the roles of a high speed, competitive, focused operation. And of her young apprentice, now a graduating senior at the Academy of Our Lady of Guam, Gaza's role as mentor was equally rewarding as she shared a special final message about her growth. I am just so proud of her. I, I have known Padme for many years um, and uh, I have seen her grow into a very intelligent and responsible young lady. She has a heart of gold and I want to hire her. I want her to hurry up and get through college and come back and see me. The JA Company of the Year and runner-up Ginif Saga, sponsored by our friends at Title Guarantee, will represent Guam at the JA Asia Pacific's annual celebration of young regional entrepreneurs. So, a very well-deserved congrats and bravo to Padme and her CreateAbility crew and for all this year's teams. We're extremely proud of your accomplishments and you can bet we'll be cheering you on. Stay tuned next on Weekend Edition, we have trend spotting with Peter Santos and still to come sports with Dave Delgado. Get up to the minute news, plus access to alerts, streaming radio, promotions, and more on your mobile device by downloading the KUAM News mobile app, available at the App Store now. While we've all been through a lot over the years, typhoons, earthquakes, and now COVID-19, we've been able to get through these together. For more than 80 years, Alba's Insurance has been protecting your homes, your businesses, and the health of your family. We are here today and we'll be here tomorrow. There are better days ahead. Tomorrow's a new day filled with hope and choices. The possibilities of what we can achieve together are limitless. Let's continue to work together to ensure a brighter tomorrow for all of us.
was a huge and crazy week in news, both here on Guam and in the nation. We finally have a new president, hopefully turning a page on a divided country. And here on Guam, we struggled with a horrific murder in a southern village that thankfully has some resolution. I'm Peter Santos, and here's your trend spotting report. Let's get the most devastating story out of the way first. Guam was shaken to the core when the details came out about the gruesome murder of a 51-year-old man in Santa Rita. On Tuesday, police responded to a southern apartment building where a woman found her husband dead and beheaded in his wheelchair. According to court documents, the woman was with the victim, 51-year-old Andrew Ray Castro, earlier that morning. When she left to work, Castro was with 40-year-old Donovan Ornelas. It didn't take the police too long to find their suspect. In less than 24 hours, Ornelas was picked up for the crime and admitted his actions, including where he left Castro's head. Sadly, police were able to recover it in a dead jungle where Ornelas placed it in a burnt-out car. Court documents state Ornelas admitted to using the drug ice inside the apartment before taking a knife to Castro. Ornelas was charged with first-degree murder and aggravated assault. In his magistrate hearing, bail was set at $1 million in cash. This was a difficult and horrific incident for all involved, including the police. And it was difficult for you, too. Josie Akfaji said, My deepest and sincerest condolences to the family. Guam Life 671 said, Drugs and drug-related crimes are taking over our island. Don't do it. Stay away from people who do it. And Jessica Untalon shared, My cousin didn't deserve to die this way. May he rest in peace. Condolences to my entire Castro familia. We love you, Dung. For those commenting, we as a family don't need to see rude or sarcastic remarks. Thanks. Shifting to the nation's capital, a day ahead of the presidential inauguration, the nation paused for a ceremony remembering the 400,000 Americans lost to COVID-19. It was a solemn candlelit ceremony held at the Lincoln Memorial with President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris attending. The moment of mourning was shared across the nation where similar ceremonies were held. On Guam, Governor Lulian Guerrero asked businesses and organizations to have a moment of silence during Guam's COVID memorial. Next to the Laddie of Freedom in Adeloup, a bell tolled 128 times during that moment, once for each life on Guam taken by the virus. At the beginning of this pandemic, FEMA had projected that we could lose as many as 3,000 lives. Knowing this was not an option, we did whatever we could under our authority to protect our island and keep our people safe. But even one death is one too many. And we are here today to remember each person whose life was cut too short because of COVID-19. And back to the nation's capital, we celebrated the inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. Harris is the first woman to become vice president, a milestone on its own. But she's also the first black and South Asian vice president in U.S. history. The last four years under the Trump administration were contentious, to say the least. It was climaxed a week before the inauguration with the violent storming of the Capitol building more than a week ago. At a Save America rally, Trump continued to push the false narrative that the election was stolen and directed his supporters to protest at the Capitol. That prompted thousands of National Guard troops to be deployed to Washington ahead of the inauguration to provide security. And even if we can't vote for our president, Guam sent dozens of National Guard members to assist in the inauguration. Luckily, just a few threatening incidences were discovered and handled, leading to the peaceful transition of power and historic ceremony. Viewer Larissa shared, Thank y'all for your service. May our Heavenly Father guide y'all and protect y'all along your duties. And to a safe return back home. God bless. And PXP.Enterprise said, We'll all be waiting on your safe return home. And if we're talking about what's gone viral this week, we're going to have to keep up with the inauguration and a peculiar photo that's caught the nation's attention. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders was captured in a curious pose, bundled up in a large heavy coat, sitting socially distant from the crowd, arms crossed and legs crossed, and wearing large mittens. Now there's nothing really funny about this picture until it took on a life of its own as a meme. Take a look at what Uno magazine shared placing the senator in different island scenes. I mean, Bernie at the Liberation Parade is pretty hilarious. And we asked you to share some of your photos too. After a wild week in news, we hope you enjoyed ending it with a little bit of silliness. Thanks to everyone who continues to comment on all the videos. We'll see you next week. Until then, adios.